In this lecture, we're going to talk about the special senses. The special senses include smell, taste, vision, hearing, and equilibrium. Unlike the general senses, which are found throughout the body, the special senses are housed in complex sensory organs and are located in very special places. Um, for instance, uh, the sense of smell, of course, is located at the top of the nasal cavity, whereas the sense of taste is found in the tongue, uh, the epiglottis, parts of the throat, also vision, of course, is in the eyes, uh, hearing and equilibrium in the ears. Now, the sense of smell is the first one, and this is uh, the sense of olfaction. Okay, and sensory receptors are chemoreceptors, which means uh, we're going to detect uh, tiny little chemicals. Those chemicals are going to bind to the olfactory nerve, cranial nerve number one, and this is what's going to create an action potential or nerve impulse to the olfactory areas of the brain. So sensory information travels along the cranial nerve one, the olfactory nerve, to the temporal lobe. And the temporal lobe is where our sense of smell is located. So what happens is odorants are going to bind to receptors. Sodium channels are going to open. Depolarization occurs. And the nerve impulse or action potential is triggered. And if we take a look at this picture over here, um, we can see the cribriform plate. If you remember that in the skull, um, it didn't take up very much space, but uh, uh, that was the part of the skull that had the little holes in it. Cribriform means it's full of holes. And uh, the cranial nerve number one um, is what uh, came through those holes. So uh, really when we talked about the cranial nerves, uh, we couldn't really see cranial nerve number one because they are so small, almost microscopic, uh, or pretty much microscopic. And uh, so as you can see, they're going to come down through these holes. Um, you're going to have the olfactory epithelium right here. That uh, olfactory epithelium is going to have a coating of mucus, although you think it's mucus, but it's not. Okay, that was a bad joke. Yeah, it is mucus. And the purpose of the mucus is it, it's very sticky, and uh, the odorant molecules can adhere to the, to the uh, mucus. And it's at that point that can come in contact uh, with the olfactory hairs, uh, which are part of the olfactory receptor cells, which then um, are part of the olfactory um, nerve, cranial nerve number one. So adaptation and odor thresholds. Adaptation equals decreasing sensitivity. In other words, um, if you do cooking, for instance, uh, there's times I'll be cooking something and, um, you know, it's it smells fairly good but if you go outside or another part of the room and then walk back into the kitchen all of a sudden it's like wow that smells really good that's because while you're in the kitchen um, your sense of smell becomes adapted to that smell and you might not notice it okay uh, but if you leave for a while okay they can kind of reset themselves and uh, when you come back in um, you you again notice that smell um, so olfactory adaptation is rapid. It's about 50% in one second, complete in about a minute. Now, our threshold for odors is actually very low, which means we only need a few molecules to be present in order to detect um, the presence of a smell. And I don't know if you realize this, but natural gas, and I'm talking about the kind you cook with, um, but uh, natural gas... Uh, like on your stove and what have you, is odorless. That's right, it doesn't have a smell to it. And you're like, wait a second, you know, if the gas is turned on, I can smell it. Well, that's because, again, naturally occurring gas has no smell to it. So the factories 
um, the refineries add a chemical called methyl mercaptan to the gas. And this way, we can detect that odor and we associate it uh, with the gas itself, even though natural gas has no odor. Um, so it's kind of a warning signal, uh, because if we didn't, weren't able to smell it at all, um, you know, we could have a gas leak, not know it, light, you know, a burner or something and um, cause an explosion or even just breathing the, the gas fumes are toxic. But the methyl mercaptan, they don't have to put much in. You know, it's just a little bit because of the low threshold we have uh, for odors. And we are going to detect that smell. Now the olfactory pathways, the axons from the olfactory uh, receptors, form the olfactory nerves, cranial nerve number one, that synapse in the olfactory bulb. And again, it's going to pass through the 40 foramina of the cribriform plate. And the second order neurons are within the olfactory bulb. And they form the olfactory tract that synapses with the primary olfactory area of the temporal lobe. And this is where conscious awareness of smell begins. And other pathways lead to the frontal lobe, and that's uh, Brodmann's Area 11, where identification of odors occur. Now, I don't really want you to, I, I guess, um, get too worried about the Brodmann areas. Okay, but uh, the fact that it's one thing to smell a particular smell, it's another thing to identify it and know what it is. Okay, and so that's in a different part of the brain. And we typically refer to those areas as association areas. And now we're going to talk about the sense of taste. And another word for taste is gustation. And so taste buds on the tongue are special organs of taste or the gustatory sense. And receptors are classified as chemoreceptors. In other words, chemicals in the foods that we chew up are going to bind to receptors and create an action potential, which is going to help us determine the taste. And there are four basic taste sensations. There is sweet, salty, sour, bitter, and a fairly new one that uh, you don't see in the older books, uh, and that's uh, umami. And, uh, well, here I got a little video that might help you with umami. So this guy walks in looking to pick a fight. I'm like, look, buddy, I don't want any trouble. He's like, what are you, chicken? I'm like, well, as a matter of fact, I am chicken and bacon, tomato, lettuce, with a little chipotle mayo. And he's like, oh, you think you're hot stuff, huh? I'm like, well, the chipotle mayo's got a little bit of a zip to it, but, uh, hey, it uh, tastes pretty good. And he's like, oh, yeah, it tastes pretty good, huh? Well, what do you taste like? I'm thinking, what is this guy coming from? What do I taste like? Taste. Okay, there's there's five different tastes, uh, technically. You know, there's uh, sweet, there's sour, salty, bitter, and your mommy. Well, that's kind of what I fall under, because that's, uh, yeah, a little more savory. So I'm like, yeah, I taste like you mommy. And he's like, what? I'm like, I told you I taste like you mommy. He's like, don't go talking about my mommy. And I'm like, no, it's not my mommy. It's you mommy. I taste like you mommy. He's like, hey, buddy. It keep it up and i'm like whoa 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 look here but uh, you know i'm just not in the mood okay so i don't know after he threatens to kick my buns he finally leaves oh geez i don't know about this guy here but i'm glad he left i guess he just couldn't cut the mustard <laughs> okay so technically it's pronounced umami it's a Japanese word that refers to uh, a savory taste. And if you want to know what savory is, well, think about like chewing on meat. Uh, meat has a savory flavor. Mushrooms have a savory flavor. I mean, would you describe meat as sweet or salty or sour or bitter? Uh, if you do, the, you've either seasoned the meat or it's uh, gone bad <laughs> or something like that. But uh, umami is... is um, Again, uh, savory. And if we look over at the picture here, and I don't have it mapped out for umami, um, I, I've been having a hard time finding a good uh, picture map of that. But uh, 
If we take a look at the tongue, we can see where sweet is located and where salty is located. Off to the sides is going to be sour and toward the back of the tongue is going to be bitter. And most things that are bitter have kind of a toxic component to it. It has um, a lot of alkaloids which make it bitter. If you've ever eaten things like dandelion greens or arugula or any of those type of um, uh, vegetables or um, leafy greens um, that have a bitter component to it. Um, now for us, they're not toxic. Um, but a lot of things are. Like, for instance, if you chew up an aspirin, it's very bitter. Most medications, if it starts to dissolve on your tongue or if you have to chew it up, it's very bitter. Okay. And bitter things, again, in high quantities can be toxic. So that's kind of a defense mechanism that if it's really bitter, you might gag and you might spit it out. Uh, but like I said, a lot of the leafy greens uh, that tend to be bitter um, are not bad for us. In fact, a lot of animals like uh, rabbits and turtles and things like that will will seek out these bitter greens. And if you think about like a dandelion, if you break it, there's like a white milky substance that comes out. That's the alkaloids. But these animals will seek these things out and eat them because, uh, well, a wild animal uh, doesn't have access to a veterinarian if it's not feeling well. And uh, wild animals are especially susceptible to internal parasites and so if they eat these bitter things these alkaloids a lot of times that will either kill the parasite or make a very inhospitable environment for that parasite so the bitter uh, area again on the tongue is toward the back and again it's kind of a defense mechanism now sensory information is going to travel along the facial nerve which is cranial nerve number four and that's going to innervate the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. And it's actually a branch of the facial nerve called the corda tympani nerve. And what's interesting is the corda tympani nerve, its route kind of passes just behind the eardrum. And sometimes if you're looking in somebody's ears with a notoscope, um, sometimes you can see the little shadow of the corda tympani nerve going past that eardrum. And kind of an interesting phenomenon, it doesn't happen often, but it, it can happen, where vibrations from the tympanic membrane can stimulate that, uh, that um, corda tympani nerve, and people can actually taste sound. So, and I know your question, well, what does sound taste like? Well, I don't know. I've never had that happen, but hopefully they're listening to some, uh, I don't know, some pretty sweet tunes. <laughs> But, um, and that would make sense, right? Anterior two-thirds of the tongue. But anyway, um, getting back to this, uh, again, that's kind of rare. Uh, the next is the glossopharyngeal nerve, which is cranial nerve number nine. And that takes care of the posterior third of the tongue. Now, one thing not mentioned on here is cranial nerve number 10, which is vagus nerve. Vagus nerve is going to innervate the epiglottis. And again, the epiglottis... Um, as you can see right here, uh, is a little flap, again, that covers over your airways. And uh, it, it does receive taste information. So you do taste as you're swallowing the food. Okay, and so these nerves go to various parts of the brain. Eventually it arrives at the gustatory cortex of the parietal lobe. Now one thing I wanted to talk about Usually when we think of taste buds, we think of those little bumps on your tongue. Those bumps are not taste buds. Those are what we call papilla. And there's different shapes of papilla. Uh, this is a filiform papilla. And uh, you ever have a cat uh, lick you? Cat's tongues are very scratchy. And it's because they contain a lot of these filiform papilla. And if you notice, there are no taste buds associated with the filiform papilla. Over here, we have the valate or circumvallate papilla. And uh, the circumvallate papilla have the taste buds running along the sides here. And then if we keep going in a clockwise formation here, we see the foliate papilla. It's kind of shaped like a leaf, sort of, if you use your imagination. 
um, but it's going to have taste buds along the sides as well. So you can see taste buds are actually microscopic. Then we go over to the fungiform papilla. It's called fungiform because it's kind of mushroom shaped. And it also has taste buds associated with it. And so we have about 10,000 taste buds found on the tongue, soft palate, and larynx. And it's found on the sides of the circumvallate, the foliate, and the fungiform uh, papilla. And it's going to have basically three cell types. It's going to have a supporting cell and a receptor and basal cells. And so this is what a taste bud would look like. It's an oval body. It consists of about 50 receptor cells. And it's going to be surrounded by supporting cells. Now here's the gross part. Coming out of the middle of each of these taste buds is a single gustatory hair. And it's going to come up through the taste pore. So it's kind of gross that you, you actually have little hairs coming out uh, of the taste buds on your tongue. I don't know about you, but the thought of hair on my tongue kind of grosses me out. Uh, but we do. We have this little single gustatory hair sticking out. And then uh, here we have the basal cells, and they develop into new receptor cells about every 10 days or so. Let's look at the physiology of taste. Uh, we have complete adaptation in about one to five minutes. So uh, try chewing food for a while. After a while, you start to lose the taste, partly because you're you are kind of sucking out the good juices there. Um, but also because um, it's adapting. Okay, your tongue is adapting and you're not really noticing the flavor. Now, we have different thresholds for taste that vary among the, uh, the four. It says four primary tastes. I haven't changed that. It is five primary tastes. Um, the most sensitive... Uh, is going to be uh, bitter or poisons. Okay, and we would want to be very sensitive to that bitter or poison taste so that we don't ex don't unintentionally um, ingest something that might harm us. The least sensitive, believe it or not, is going to be salty and sweet. And that would account for, if you look at uh, packaging on uh, processed foods, there's going to be a lot of salt and there's going to be a lot of sugar added. Sometimes they're uh, not necessarily the first ingredient, uh, but they're up there. Okay, so that's why they add so much salt and so much uh, sugar to their um, products uh, because they want us to taste it. They want us to crave that food. Now, uh, mechanisms of taste, uh, the dissolved substances uh, are going to contact the gustatory hairs. And again, this is a chemoreceptor. So the receptor potential results in neurotransmitter release, and the nerve impulse is formed in a first-order neuron. So the first-order neuron, um, or first-order gustatory fibers, are found in the cranial nerves. And we've kind of talked about this earlier, but I'll kind of mention it again to reinforce it. Um, cranial nerve number seven, the facial nerve, serves the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. Again, the branch is the corda tympani nerve. Cranial nerve number nine, the glossopharyngeal nerve, serves the posterior third of the tongue. And then we get to cranial nerve number 10, which is vagus nerve serves the palate and the epiglottis. Now signals travel to the thalamus or limbic system and also to the hypothalamus. Now we talked about the limbic system. What is the limbic system? Uh, what's its function? One of its primary functions. If you said emotions you'd be absolutely correct and this is why we have kind of an emotional connection with food. It also is very strongly connected to memory. So, and the same thing with the sense of smell, too. I didn't mention that, but uh, they both have a very strong connection to memory. And this is why if you taste something 
or smell something that uh, reminded you of grandma or your favorite uh, person or something you ate a long time ago and it, it might bring back you know happy memories or it might bring back tragic memories or what have you uh, but the bottom line is there is an emotional um, component uh, to eating to taste now taste fibers extend from the thalamus to the primary gustatory area of the parietal lobe of the cerebral cortex and it provides conscious perception of taste. Now we keep talking about taste, and again, uh, the tastes are going to be uh, sweet, salty, sour, bitter, and umami. But that is totally different than flavor. Like for instance, if I give you an orange and I have you taste it, what are you gonna tell me it tastes like? Well, you'll probably say, well, it tastes like an orange that's a flavor but if i say okay break it down you know is it is it a sweet orange is it a sour orange okay well it might be sweet if you got a good one uh, it would be a sweet orange okay maybe if you put a little salt on it, it would be sweet and salty or if you got a little bit of the uh, uh kind of the rind or the pith of the uh, orange uh, that tends to be a little bit bitter now those are tastes now here's the thing, the sense of taste and the sense of flavor, um, they're connected to, or, or I should say the sense of taste and uh, the sense of olfaction or smell, that is what gives us flavor. Okay, so the sense of smell, the sense of taste is what gives us flavor. And I want you to try this sometime. Um, if you can get a hold of some uh, Skittles or Starbursts, Starbursts are probably pretty good for this. Um, I'd like you to uh, get one, you know, have a, a friend um, or somebody you trust uh, handing you something you're going to stick in your mouth. But, uh, you know, have them pick one, not tell you what it is. Hold your nose and close your eyes, put it in your mouth, chew it, and see if you can tell what flavor it is. Chances are you're probably not going to know the flavor. You're going to taste that it's sweet. You're going to taste that it's, you know, maybe sour. Okay. But when you let go of your nose, okay, and chew some more, now you're going to pick up the flavor. Because, again, olfaction has a strong connection to uh, uh, flavor. And that's why, like, if your nose is plugged up, um, food just doesn't taste right. Okay, because you have to have that uh, smell component. Okay, the sense of sight. The visual accessory organs of sight are going to include the eyebrows. And the eyebrows basically are there to help keep um, sweat from rolling down into the eyes. Um, one of my slides uh, talks about it acts as shade, but I'm thinking unless you're a Neanderthal, you're not going to get much shade from your eyebrows. That seemed like a goofy thing. Um, your eyelids, and your eyelids do a few different things. Uh, uh, one, every time you blink, the eyelids kind of wipe over the eyes to um, take off dusts and uh, grit that might be on the eyes. Um, helps to close up the eyes when you uh, sleep. It protects the eyes. So if something is going to poke you in the eye, the eyelid will close. Okay, so they do quite a few different uh, things. The eyelashes, again, it's kind of a protectant uh, mechanism. Something touches the eyelash first, um, it's going to stimulate the blink reflex. Okay. We also have uh, the lacrimal apparatus. The lacrimal apparatus is what produces tears. Now, where do you think the tear ducts are? Or the tear glands? Let me let me rephrase that. Where do you think the tear glands are? And if you can't just, I can't see you, but uh, point to where you think the tear glands are. Now, a lot of you have probably pointed to the corner of your eye toward your nose. And that is not correct. Now, tear ducts are found there. But the tear glands are going to be in the superior lateral aspect of the skull 
you know, of the orbit of your eye there, um, just behind the eye. Okay, so it's going to be found in the, the uh, orbit in the skull, uh, upper outer quadrant there, uh, behind the eyeball. And think about it like this. The lacrimal gland is kind of like a rain cloud. It's producing tears. Um, and you think about where clouds are, and clouds are up above. And through gravity, it pulls the, the rain toward the earth. Uh, same thing here. Um, gravity is going to help uh, flood um, tears over the eye to help uh, nourish it, to help wash away dust and dirt, and um, basically keep the eye healthy. There's enzymes in uh, tears called lysozyme. Again, they help to kill bacteria and things like that. Okay. And then we have the extrinsic eye muscles, and that um, allows for movement of the eyeball in the socket. And so if you haven't already, take a look at the video I made on the um, eye muscles. Now the eyeball has three layers. We have the sclera, the choroid, and the retina. The sclera, um, well let's take that word apart for a second here. Scleris means tough. And it's the tough outer covering of the eyeball. So it's the outermost layer that extends anteriorly and eventually forms the cornea. But it's the whites of your eyes. So predominantly it's the whites of the eyes. The choroid is going to be your middle layer and that's rich in blood vessels. The next layer, the retina, that's going to be the innermost layer. It's the nervous layer that contains photoreceptors, uh, rods and cones. And uh, we'll talk about those in just a little bit. Uh, the rods and cones are the photoreceptors. And they are going to detect light. And again, when they detect light, you're going to get an action potential. And so the eyeball also has two cavities. We have a posterior cavity. It's located between uh, the lens and the retina. And it's filled with a kind of a thick, snotty um, solution um, that's called the vitreous humor. Okay, it's real, well, like I said, thick and snotty. If you've ever dissected an eyeball, maybe in high school, um, you'll know what that kind of looks like. The anterior cavity, located between the lens and the cornea, is filled with something called aqueous humor. Okay, and uh, aqueous means water, so it's, it's more of a watery fluid. Now, one thing, um, the eye is constantly making this fluid, and we're going to build up to a certain pressure. If we go too high on pressures, then, um, well, that's not good. That's going to cut off blood supply. It's going to do damage to uh, delicate tissues. And so we have to have a way of regulating that excess fluid. And so right here, um, we have what's called the Canal of Schlem. And again, we're getting away from names, so I'm sure they've changed that to a, another uh, name. But uh, the Canal of Schlem here is a little opening that allows excess uh, aqueous humor to kind of bleed off as the pressures enlarge. If that Canal of Schlem becomes blocked for whatever reason, uh, then pressures can build up in the eye and uh, we can develop glaucoma. And glaucoma is kind of one of the number one uh, causes, at least in the U.S., of blindness. Okay, two sets of eye muscles. Uh, we have the extrinsic eye muscles and the intrinsic eye muscles. The extrinsic eye muscles are external to the eyeball and control the movement of the eyeball. And again, um, take a look at that video I made. Then the intrinsic eye muscles control the size of the pupil and the shape of the lens. Uh, and again, if you've ever dissected an eyeball, you know the lens is kind of rubbery. I remember dissecting one in high school, and um, it did. It felt like a little rubber ball, a little hard rubber ball. And, and guess what we did? Yes, we started bouncing it around on our tables. And because it's oblong, it went all over the place. Uh, but because it is kind of rubbery like that, uh, but we can attach muscles to it, uh, and these are going to be um, able to pull on the lens 
or relax and let the lens go back to its original shape. And this is going to help to focus light that's coming through that lens. Now, as far as the pupils go, uh, now, what did we learn about muscles? What do muscles do? They can only contract and relax. So, you know, if we're going to have two different movements, we're going to have to have two different sets of muscles. And that's what we're going to find here. We're going to have our circular muscles. And when they constrict, that is going to make our pupil smaller. But if we want to make our pupil larger, then we're going to need another set of muscles. We're going to relax the circular muscles, and then the radial muscles are going to contract and pull that uh, opening, um, your pupil, um, a lot more open, and uh, we're going to get a larger pupil from that. So it's kind of stretching that circular muscle back out. So we stretch the circular muscle out, um, and then if we want to constrict the pupil, then we relax the uh, radial muscles and the circular muscle constricts. Okay, enable, to enable to see, uh, light's going to enter the eye and stimulate the photoreceptors, and the nerve impulse carries the information from the photoreceptors along the optic nerve, or cranial nerve number two, to the occipital lobe of the cerebrum. And on this brain, we can see kind of the, the pathway that um, light impulses would take. It's going to start off after it enters the eye, going through the optic nerve, uh, which is cranial nerve number two. And here's the thing. if we Let's just take a look at one eyeball. So if we take a look at one eyeball, the left, or I guess what I should say is the temporal field of view, is going to come in and it's going to go down the optic nerve. It's going to stay on the same side of the optic nerve. It's not going to cross over. It's going to stay on the same side and then go down the optic tract. From the optic tract, it's going to connect up at the lateral geniculate nucleus uh, of the thalamus and hook up to the optic radiations which then go down to the occipital lobe of the brain, and that's our visual center. Now, the nasal view of the eye is actually going to come down. It's going to cross over at the optic chiasm and go down the opposite optic tract to the lateral geniculate nucleus, where then it connects up with the optic radiation and goes to the opposite side of the brain, uh, to the occipital lobe. So it's kind of interesting how that do, does that. It actually splits your, your uh, visual field up into almost quadrants. Okay, All that information is reassembled back in the visual cortex to be able to see the way we, we see. In this video, we're going to talk about visual processing, so how our brain is able to make sense of what we're looking at. So in most of the, our body, we have the right side of the body being controlled by the left side of the brain, and the left side of the body is controlled by the right side of the brain. So how does this work in vision? So let's imagine that this rectangle that I drew is our entire visual field, and if these two eyeballs were focused in at the center of this rectangle, so if they were both focused in on this purple line, all they can see are these two colors. So we have a ray of light coming in from the left visual field. It'll hit the eyeball, it'll hit the left eyeball, it'll kind of be bent a little bit by the lens, and it'll hit the right side of this eyeball. And so the inner side of the eyeball, so this side of this, the left eyeball and this side of the right eyeball is known as the nasal side because it's, the nose would be right in the middle of the eyes, so the nasal side is the side of the eyeball closest to the nose, and then this outside part of the eyeball, which is over here and over here, is known as the temporal side of the eyeball because it's closest to your temple. So this is the side closest to the temples, this is the side closest to the nose. So a ray of light coming from the left visual field will hit the nasal side of the left eye, and a ray of light coming from the left visual field will hit the right eye, be bent a little bit by the lens, and it'll hit the temporal side of the right eye. 
So let's look at a ray of light coming from the right side of the visual field. A ray of light coming from here would enter the right eye and it would be bent a little by the lens and hit the nasal side of the right eye. Whereas a ray of light coming in would hit the left eye, be bent a little, and hit the temporal side of the left eye. So let's look at what happens next. So the eye is basically connected to the brain via the optic nerve. So there is an optic nerve that kind of exits the back of the eye and goes into the brain. So interestingly, the optic nerve from both eyes actually converge. So they actually reach a point where they converge. And this point right here where they converge is known as the optic chiasm. So they kind of converge and then break off again and then move even deeper into the brain. So this point where they converge is known as the optic chiasm. So optic chiasm. Let's look at how this information is transmitted to the brain through the optic chiasm. The retina is lining the back of the eyeball and we had this yellow ray of light hit the nasal side of the left eye and it hit the temporal side of the right eye. So let's go ahead and trace this information to the brain. So the information will be sent via axons through the back of the eye into the optic nerve and basically it'll come in and what it'll do is it'll actually cross at the optic chiasm and then go this way. And what we also have is this ray of light will come in to the back of the eye and it will actually go down the optic nerve but it's not going to cross. So all light that hits the temporal side of either eyeball does not cross the optic chiasm. So let's go ahead and trace this green ray. So the green ray coming from the temporal side of the left eye is going to exit the back of the eye, go down the optic nerve, and it's just going to stay in place. So it's not going to cross the optic chiasm, whereas this ray of light is going to go through the back of the eye, and it's going to cross over here. It's going to cross the optic chiasm and go down to the brain. And so what this effectively does is it actually takes the right visual field and allows all the information that's entering the eye from the right visual field to go to the left side of the brain. So this is the left side of the brain. This is the right side of the brain. So like the rest of the body, all the information coming from the right visual field actually goes to the left side of the brain, and all the information coming from the left visual field goes to the right side of the brain. In this video, I'm going to talk about photoreceptors. The photoreceptors are located within the retina. This is the very back of the eye. So I'll just draw one out here. We're going to look at what happens to the photoreceptor when it's in the dark. So here we have a sodium channel. This is our photoreceptor. Now the sodium channel allows sodium ions, which are positively charged, to enter inside the photoreceptor. This makes the inside of the photoreceptor more positive. So if we look at the voltage over time, it's going to get more and more positive inside. So I'm going to introduce a few rules that are really important when considering the visual system. The first one is that a cell will release neurotransmitter 
when depolarized. All right, so this cell is now depolarized. When the voltage inside is much more positive, that's what we call being depolarized. So according to rule number one, this cell will have to release neurotransmitter. And there it is coming out the bottom. Now let's see what happens when light hits the photoreceptor. This channel is controlled by what we call a GPCR, which is a G protein coupled receptor. So let's see just quickly how this works. When light comes into the photoreceptor, it hits this protein called an opsin. Now, through a series of events which I don't want to go into here, this controls whether the sodium channel is open or closed. So when light hits this opsin, it closes this sodium channel. This means that sodium, these sodium ions trying to get into the cell, can't. I should say that this is a cascade of events, not just one single event. So I want to introduce my second rule. This is that light hyperpolarizes photoreceptors. And when looking at these visual systems, it can get really confusing, so it's really important to remember these two rules. And then you can kind of work things out from these principles. So let's look at the situation where light hits a photoreceptor. So here's our light, and it hits a photoreceptor. So this blocks off the sodium channel. So there's nothing happening there. Now let's look at the voltage inside the cell. If there's no sodium going in, then the cell will become more negatively charged. So the cell is hyperpolarized, and that's rule number two. Now if we look back at rule number one, that cells release neurotransmitter when depolarized, it follows that a cell won't release neurotransmitter when hyperpolarized. Now let's have a think about this neurotransmitter. The neurotransmitter used is called glutamate, which is an amino acid. But it's a very common neurotransmitter in the brain. Not that it's important, but it's got a structure that looks like this. Now one last thing, there are two types of photoreceptors, rods and cones. Rods kind of look like what I've shown here, and there are three types of cones, 
Cones that respond most to red light, to green light, and to blue light. And then there are rods, and they respond to very little light, so they're used for night vision. And that's a summary of photoreceptors. Okay, that previous video was from uh, handwrittentutorials.com, and uh, I'd like you to check that out. Now, that particular video was um, an older one, and probably one of his first videos. Um, it didn't have the quality of his uh, later videos, and uh, that might be something you want to check out, uh, especially when you get to ANP2, um, because there's a lot more physiology. Uh, also, if you go on for nursing or healthcare, he does talk about pharmacology and a few other things. So, hope it didn't bore you too much there. Uh, like I said, his other videos are, are much better, uh, but for some reason the, this slide presentation didn't cover that, and I did want to make mention of uh, the photoreceptors and some of the physiology involved. Okay, the sense of hearing. There's basically three parts to the ear. We have the outer ear, the middle ear, and the middle ear contains the three ossicles, the hammer, anvil, and stirrup, or malleus, incus, and stapes. And then we have the inner ear. Now the inner ear structure is concerned with uh, hearing, and uh, its main organ is going to be the cochlea. And it contains hearing receptors, like the organ of corti, and hair projections on the cells are mechanoreceptors. In other words, they respond to a mechanical stimulation. And in the case of the cochlea, it's basically going to be vibrations in the fluid within the canals of the uh, cochlea that are going to cause vibration of certain structures that will then vibrate and push on... Um, stereocilia or hair cells and uh, create an action potential that we interpret as hearing. So um, the organ of corti uh, looks like this. We have the tectoral membrane, we have the hair bundle um, which contains stereocilia, we have the outer hair cell and our supporting cells. And then here's our inner hair cells. And these are going to be connected with the sensory motor fibers of the cochlear branch of the vestibulocochlear nerve, which is cranial nerve number eight. Now, as fluid begins uh, to vibrate, um, this tectoral membrane is, of course, going to move. As it moves, it's going to compress these, these hair cells and um, again, an action potential is going to be created and go to the auditory portion of our brain. So as you hear sound waves entering the outer ear, it causes the tympanic membrane or eardrum to vibrate. And the vibrating tympanic membrane causes the ossicles, the little tiny bones in the ear, uh, to vibrate. The vibrating stapes causes the fluid in the inner ear to move, and then it moves the inner ear fluid, bends the hair like uh, projections at the organ of corti, like I showed you earlier. And then activation of the organ of corti creates nerve impulses that travel along the cochlear branch of the cranial nerve number uh, 8, again the vestibulocochlear nerve, and it goes then to the temporal lobe. Now also found in the inner ear is our sense of balance. And uh, the receptors, again, are mechanoreceptors, so they're going to respond to mechanical stimulation. And they are hair-like projections, and they're located in the vestibule and the semicircular canals of the inner ear. This first one found in the vestibule is um, a receptor that's activated when the head, head uh, changes position. So activation of the receptor creates a nerve impulse that travels along the vestibular branch of the vestibulocochlear nerve, cranial nerve number eight, uh, to many areas of the brain, including the cerebellum, 
the midbrain and the temporal lobe. And if you notice on this picture here, we have these things called otoliths. Lith or litho means stone. Oto means ear, so ear stones. And basically what they're going to do is give a little bit of weight. Okay, so they're going to respond to gravity. They're going to sit kind of in this gel uh, on top of this otolithic membrane and also embedded over, um, or, or I should say embedded into the otolithic membrane are these hair bundles. We're going to have kinocilium and stereocilium. And basically what, he, basically what happens here is if you tip your head down uh, because of gravity, these otoliths are going to slide forward, and when they do, they're going to distort the otolithic uh, membrane and bend these hair bundles. When the hair bundles are bent, then we're going to get an action potential, and that's going to tell us that we bent our head forward or that we tipped our head backward. Now, this also responds to acceleration. For instance, in your car, when you accelerate, it's going to cause these otoliths to go backward, okay, and give us the sense of acceleration. As you stop, these otoliths are then going to move forward and give us the sensation of deceleration. So again, as I said, the movement of the stereocilia or kinocilium results in a release of neurotransmitter into the vestibular branch of the vestibulocochlear nerve. Again, cranial nerve number eight. And now we have these other receptors. They are small elevations within each of the three semicircular ducts. We have anterior, posterior, and horizontal ducts that detect different movements. And we have these hair cells covered with cupula, uh, which is a gelatinous material. And um, when you move, the fluid in the canal bends the cupula, stimulating the hair cells that release neurotransmitter. And so when the head moves, uh, the attached semicircular uh, ducts and the hair cells move with it. The endolymph, which is found inside um, the ampulla here, it's a fluid, um, does not bend, or does not move, I should say. And so... Uh, it's going to bend the cupula and the enclosed hair cells. So nerve signals to the brain are generated, indicating uh, in which direction the head has been rotated. Now, here's the thing. If you have, a, say, a glass of water, and you have something floating on top of the water, and you kind of spin the glass, when you stop, what's going to happen? Does the water stop automatically? No, it's going to keep going. Now, if we start spinning in a circle and then stop, one thing that's going to happen is uh, the fluid is going to keep moving and then it's going to keep pushing on this cupula. And when it does, we're going to get this constant, um, this constant action potential that's telling us that we're still moving. And that's what cre makes us kind of dizzy. Now, the reason the room seems to look like it's spinning, as a result of this stimulation, the eyes are going to start moving back and forth. So if you ever get a chance to try this, you know, put your lab partner in a, in a stool or a chair that can spin, spin them around, stop them, and look at their eyes. You'll see their eyes moving back and forth. Again, that's what makes the room look like it's spinning. Um, but what's actually happening, and that, and again, that'll also add to the feeling of dizziness. Um, but what's kind of stimulating that is the uh, fluid, that endolymph, pushing on the cupula and making you still feel like you're moving. And that concludes our lecture.